delay or anything. Hey, everybody, I have got the panel together. There is one missing, and that would be Dan. I allegedly, he's having some technical difficulties. But this cash roundtable is going to be to talk to other people uh, in the community that are following what's going on about the things that are at hand. You know, there's uh, people in this segment, I want to talk about uh, the person, and I, this person has 50 to a million dollars in the bank. You know, the, this particular person has $400,000 in the bank. They are prepped. I mean, they're doing well. They're, they're looking at retirement. You know, there's several of those people that are, are scared. They're absolutely scared on what to do. What, what should I do? You know, they don't want to sit on the ice cube that's melting out from under them. And, and they've got their preps, they've, they, they've done their due diligence, they're paying attention, you know, they've got food, they, they're doing everything they're supposed to do, but they've got their money in the bank, because what are you supposed to do, put it in a safe, you know, and then, then what do you do, it's, it's, it'll be worth your $400,000 will buy, you know, $320,000 worth of goods by the end of next year, if inflation keeps going the way it's going, if it doesn't get any worse. Uh, so that's what this is about. Now, uh, I'm going to try to let these guys talk and do a decent interview. I don't talk too much, but I kind of wanted to set the stage because uh, this is a really important question that we get asked often, and there is no straightforward answer. So thank you guys for being here. And let's just kind of get into it with uh, where do we start? Where do we start with this uh, this question, this person that doesn't want to get into Tesla stock, uh, the Fang stocks, because back in 1933, you know, people lost everything they had buying the dip, you know, and we're looking at something kind of like that. So uh, let's just kind of get into it from here. Go ahead, Joe. Why don't you go first? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um the uh, so just starting off, like you know, without knowing anything about the person's exact situation, my my general kind of outline step process that I work through is uh, it fo it follows Maslow's hierarchy. So basically, you got to look at your most basic needs first and make sure you're covered there. Um, and I'm sure you talk about this, you know, uh, plenty. So anybody on here is probably already covered in that area. So you know, your water, your food, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so then we look at, okay, well, I've built a certain amount of wealth uh, through uh, doing business, through my job, just through saving my entire life. And now it looks like the situation is different. And I'm concerned about the uh, value of that wealth being maintained. And it's scary because we got two choices in front of us that kind of give different answers on, on what's going to happen because severe inflation has a very different set of rules to survive through and thrive through than severe deflation. Um, and so you kind of have to, you have kind of have to be watching the way that the tide is going because those have different strategies to be able to, uh, uh, to be able to survive and thrive through. So for instance, severe inflation, you want to, uh, own things and short cash, severe deflation. You want to own cash and short things because uh, the value between everything versus money is, uh, you know, it's going to go one way or the other, depending on whether we have inflation or deflation. Um, and we can get more into that, but basically right now what's happening is uh, uh, inflation in goods and services and deflation in assets. Um, and so your cash looks great compared to assets over the last, you know, year or so, uh, and your cash is trash compared to the stuff you actually need to survive. Um, and so that's why I start off with Maslow's hierarchy, because you have to kind of work through it. Like, do, what, what do I need uh, to survive and thrive um, and work through it that way? Because for some of those things, cash is better. For preservation of wealth, you might have a different, uh, different answer. So we can dive into all of that, but that's kind of the, the framework from where I'd start from. All right, Jack, what do you, uh, what do you, what say you about this subject? Yeah, Joe was right on the money there. We're, we're kind of approaching this crossroads, right? You hear people talking about the Fed pivot, will they or won't they, or when will they? And depending on which decision they choose, one is the right choice and the other could be the wrong choice. And until you know which way that's going to go, you can't really make that call. So I have to echo what Joe is saying right now, cash is 
actually not a terrible position to be in. Um, it stinks to look at inflation numbers, look at the price of everything that we consume going up. But to Joe's point, assets are deflating right now. Gold and silver are going down. Real estate, probably going to start going down. Or actually, it just did start going down just a little bit. Stocks are certainly going down. Bonds, my God, bonds are going down. So any asset you would buy with that cash, probably going to be cheaper a few months from now. So unfortunately, we're kind of in this position right now where you have to you don't have to, but you're, you're in a position where one of the best options available is to just eat this inflation sitting in cash because anything you buy is going to go down in nominal value and you know, the inflation is going to eat away at, that nominal, at the spending power of that nominal value. Um, now, I'm, I'm kind of in a position right now. Uh, I just made a lot of changes in my life. Um, I just became a full-time YouTuber, which is great because you know, Google Alphabet just reported earnings yesterday and their earnings were in the toilet, mostly because YouTube earnings are down. <laughs> so great timing, Jack. So take everything I tell you with a bag of salt currently. Um, but I'm in a position now where I'm, I'm having to take with me my 401k from my previous employer. I'm having to cash out of my pension system that I was in at my previous employer. And I also have this little IRA that I started back when I was a commercial fisherman years ago that I kind of haven't done anything with for years. So I'm in a position where I have to do something with all these assets. Um, I can't just sit there and leave it in the standard 60-40 portfolio. Right now, that is just getting absolutely clobbered. Stocks are heading down. Bonds are heading down. And this is kind of unusual because the very concept of retirement accounts and 401ks, it's pretty new. Really, it's only like one generation old. Two or three generations ago, there weren't 401ks. So as long as the whole concept of retirement has been around, Bonds have really just gone up in value because interest rates have been going down steadily since 1980. There's never really been a period of sustained higher interest rates where bonds have shown that, hey, these are not really safe investments under, in those circumstances. So a lot of people are looking back at the playbook of the last 20 years or even the last 40 years, and they're saying, just do this. Trust me, it'll be fine. The last 40 years is not the playbook you want to go by right now. Because we've never had a period of this asset deflation with severe inflation at the same time. We've never had to deal with a 2008 GFC and the inflation of the 1970s all at the same time. So for now, while I'm doing this, I've started a custodial IRA. I'm going to stay largely in cash as I move my retirement over there. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of precious metals, a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver, a very small amount of Bitcoin. To start, but I'm going to stay mostly in cash and I'm going to just average down over the next few months. Now, I also want to throw the caveat in there that my wife still has her day job. She still has her investments. So we're leaving hers there. She's still got a pension. She's still got a 401k. That's going to stay in the standard 60 40 and she's going to stay in the pension system. So if I'm wrong and we go the route of hyperinflation and assets go to the moon, her money is still positioned accordingly. If I'm right and the pivot is a long way off and everything is going to burn, I'm safe in cash. So I'm kind of hedging and positioned either way. All right. So that's perfect. That's <clears throat> most of the millionaires I know are holding cash. They're, they're bracing for impact and watching asset prices because they plan on buying asset prices at the very bottom, uh, just like we all are. Uh, but it sounds like according to you guys, the decision we need to kind of wrap our head around is, is it deflation or inflation first? What comes first? It, that kind of helps us uh, figure out what to do. And how do we do that? Is that, am I on the right track? And do you agree? Um, I, okay. Back in, uh, I, I don't remember when it was, but it was earlier this year when the Federal Reserve started saying, hey, we're going to we're going to start getting tighter to combat inflation. Z about about zero people believed them. I think the only people that believed that they were going to do any sort of tightening were themselves. And um, once it became apparent that they were actually going to raise rates and continue to raise rates at faster and faster paces, um, people realized, hey, we're in for we're in for some economic pain here. Um, that's been going on now since January. And so uh, a lot of people right now are looking at they've just gotten used to, hey, economic pain ahead. And we've already seen a full bear market um, 
happen in all of the major stock indexes and not to mention most of the bubble stocks that we saw IPO and go up 10 times in 2020 and 2021 are all down 80, 90, 95%. You look at stocks like Coinbase and Robinhood and DocuSign, um, and those are the ones that aren't even fraudulent companies. You look at a company like Nikola, um, some of these places where people thought they were just going to get extremely wealthy overnight, all that wealth has evaporated. The only ones that have hung on and not gotten hurt too bad are the major players like, you know, the Apple and the Amazon and the, you know, the, the big players. Um, and so we've already seen a significant amount, maybe not anywhere near what we could see, but we have seen a significant amount of pain already in terms of asset prices. Um, what this says to me is that it's starting to get to the point where um, people might be, uh, uh, the, the contrarian thing a year ago was to say uh, that there would be pain. Everybody thought there'd be no pain. Now the contrarian thing is almost to say the pain's almost over. Um, and if we look at what just happened in the UK, if we look at what's happening with the Bank of Japan and Japan, if we look at what's happening in China, what's happening with Russia and Ukraine and all over Europe, and then we say, hey, look, the problems in the United States, financially speaking, between the government and the central bank are fairly similar, if not as severe in certain areas, which means that there must be a pivot coming at some point. Um, it is too politically uh, unpopular to stick with austerity and stick with the healthy route that is economically painful for too much longer from here on out. That suggests to me that we might not be at the bottom, but we might be near the bottom. And the people who in 2010 and then in 2011 and then in 2012 were still waiting for another leg down are still today waiting for another leg down, or maybe they were the people that bought in 2021. Um, and so um, I would personally rather be the person who buys in 1933 and in 1934 and in 1935. And yes, it's still falling, but it's already fallen a lot. And I know what I'm buying is valuable because I know how to read financial statements and I know how to do some basic calculations. And I know that this thing in five years and 10 years is going to be worth more than it's worth today, even if in one year it's worth a lot less. And I'd rather keep on putting money into those world-class assets as they get cheaper, knowing that that's just going to make me more wealthy long-term. Whether we have inflation or deflation, that part doesn't change. Okay. So you're saying uh, short-term pain is about over. They're going to pivot and print money because that's what all governments do. Uh, the 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 cure to all this in the government's eyes is making money. It makes the pain go away for a short term. And that's going to stimulate the stock market, uh, I would imagine, short term, because that can't be, uh, that can't, can't go on forever. Is that, uh, that is really nutshelling what you say, but uh, is that where you're at? I mean, it's, we're kind of short term over. And then what, what's after that though? Is there, is it, so short and then the real crash happens. I mean, we're looking at something that hasn't been seen before. I mean, we're looking at a lot of dollars all over the globe that could run back home that we're looking at uh, several scenarios that we're looking at bank bail-ins. We're looking at, uh, you know, uh, the stock market going down another 50% from here, possibly more, you know, but you're saying possibly take small bites as it comes down and you'll be sitting good when it does start to go back up. Is that, am I close? Yeah. Well, basically, yeah, because you don't even really in that situation with that mindset, you don't have to predict inflation or deflation or how long the pain will last. Because let's say they try and go the most painful route short term. They try and keep on raising rates. They try and keep on selling assets off their balance sheet. They try and bring uh, government spending down. They allow pension payments to default. They allow social security payments to stop going up with uh, with the rate of inflation. They they see all of the uh, the unfunded liabilities and they actually start to cut back. They lower taxes. Government gets smaller. They 
do the short-term painful stuff that's healthy long-term, asset prices will continue to take a hit. But what that means is that the really good companies will be the ones that survive by default because they're more healthy. They've been more financially responsible. They have bigger economic moats. They have bigger competitive advantages. And so the ones that you keep buying that keep surviving will be positioned to be the best assets in the world in 10, 15, 20 years. On the other hand, if we get the inflation where we get this the quick pivot, they buy assets again, they print money to fund government spending, uh, they print money to to, for you know, handing out stimulus checks to make a new CBDC and we get the inflation, well then dollars become basically worthless, at least worth a lot less, which means that the, the prices of everything measured in those dollars have to go up as the value of the measurement units go down. And so the prices of assets, whether they're good assets or not, have to go up because there's just way more dollars floating around bidding up those prices. So either way, I'm looking at this as an opportunity to try and buy better companies at better prices because deflation or inflation, the best companies are going to be the ones that are going to make you wealthy long term, even though it's hard to do that right now when, uh, as Warren Buffett says, there's blood in the streets. And uh, for everybody that uh, likes here, likes what Joe's saying, I've got a link in the description below. He's, it's an asset uh, allocation class. And I would recommend that to anybody that is struggling, trying to figure out what to do with your portfolio right now, because there's going to be millionaires made as the markets do this and then this and then this. And, and if you if you are in the right spots, you could very well prosper from it. It's in the description. Check it out. So, Jack, uh, you are, are you thinking short term, uh, short term uh, deflation and then long-term inflation or how, how are you looking at it? I struggle with this because it, it's hard to see past a choice that I'm not making right now. Jerome Powell, chairman of the federal reserve. He has his dual mandate. The fed has two jobs and don't they just suck at both of them? Um, one of them is maximum employment. All right. That's their, their first job is make sure as many people are working as possible. And the other one is price stability. Well, right now we definitely don't have price stability. Right. Even if you believe the government statistics and that inflation is really 8.2%, it's really closer to 18, that is not price stability. And as far as full employment, we have people leaving the workforce. You know, people let millions of people left the workforce and they have not come back yet. The economy is, I'm sorry, the job market is not giving the economy the workers that it needs. For whatever reason, people have left the job market because maybe it doesn't pay enough for them to stay in the job market or childcare costs have gotten so much. The cost of living and the wages are so out of balance that people are refusing to participate in the labor market. And the Federal Reserve's solution is to try to drag them back in with economic hardship or to just destroy the jobs with economic hardship so that supply and demand are back in balance. Right? So they're, they're playing games with the economy right now. And until inflation comes down, they have to keep doing that. Because on paper, if you look at the stats, on paper, it looks like the Fed is doing a great job with unemployment being so low, even though if you really dig into the numbers, the employment situation is a mess. So they are going to stay on this course as long as inflation stays high, or at least until they, as long as they hold true to their mandate. And maybe Jerome Powell gets forced out or he resigns suddenly. That might be an indicator that something is about to change in that path, but that's not happening yet. And I just don't think inflation is over yet. I mean, we have a trend of deglobalization that's going on right now, all of the outsourcing of the last 40 years, all the factories that were shipped over to China, shipped into other countries. You know, as my moderator, Mish says, China's going back behind the curtain right now. Countries are getting out of China. There's capital flight from China. I just did a video about that on my channel today. People are leaving that part of the world. And plus the cost of labor in China has gone up now to where the benefits of relocating manufacturing over there aren't what they used to be. So those jobs are coming back. You have to hire more expensive Americans or, you know, folks in Mexico or in Canada or just closer to here to have these things made now. And that's more expensive. That means those prices are going up because American labor is more expensive. American compliance is more expensive. Our environmental laws are tighter. All the things that make it harder to do, do business in this country. Look at the CHIPS Act, for example. You know, we're scrambling to build these multi-billion dollar CHIPS facilities because we can't rely on the supply chain from China anymore. That's going to happen across all industries over the next few decades. The world is deglobalizing, and that's going to be hugely inflationary. 
So this idea that inflation has peaked any day now, it's going to come down because the Fed raised 50 basis points or 75. I think that ignores the reality of the situation, not to mention the whole energy circus going on in Europe and the energy circus going on here in the States. Energy is going to get more expensive. And the only reason inflation has even come down at all in the last few months is because they've dumped the strategic petroleum reserve and they've overinflated the supply of oil to lower gas prices a little bit. Well, that's going away also. So I think inflation is going to come roaring back. And the idea that the Fed will any day now change course and start inflating asset prices again, they would have to ignore their dual mandate from Congress to do that. Maybe they do that, but that would be against their mandate. So it would be the political expedient thing to do, because if like, look how quick the UK pivoted in on September 28th, right? They were hours away from their pensions failing. And no politician wants to be in charge when people lose their pension. Nobody wants, nobody wants to see grandma broke, right? So they'll pivot like that if that happens. Now, it won't be the stock market that causes that. It'll be the bond market that causes that. So I think you're probably better off watching interest rates and watching liquidity in the bond market versus what the Dow Jones is doing or what the NASDAQ is doing. That might be a better indicator. But for the Fed to suddenly change direction, I think requires much more pain than we've seen so far. Much more. Okay. So if I understand right, the stock market has to make a seven point, the, the retirement funds have to make 7.5% to pay the pension holders, the retirees. Are we on board? Am I right there? Because they're, they're broke. The pension funds are broke. They I think have it's to probably gamble like, in the stock market to make the money to pay the people. Well, they actually, with with what happened in the UK, they gambled in the bond market more so than the stock market. Okay. Um, they they did they have been going into riskier assets, but they took out these leveraged swap contracts, which I, I don't want to take all the time to explain what they are. Yeah, but they were basically very risky bets that interest rates were going to go down. And for the last 40 years, interest rates have gone down. So it seemed like a sure thing. And it worked out so well that back in December of last year, all these pension funds were congratulating themselves on finally being fully funded and making up all their funding shortfalls. And hey, we're devoting $130 million to achieving net zero targets and all this other stuff that had nothing to do with providing for their retirees. And now all of a sudden, they're on the brink of insolvency because interest rates flipped on January 1st and they started going up. And now they're bleeding cash like crazy. And it almost bankrupted the whole pension system in the UK. And our pensions here in the States use that same strategy. Hopefully, our pension funds have started unloading these products because it just if they haven't, then we just haven't, haven't hit the number yet where that happens here. That's just one of the pains that would make them pivot. <clears throat> and there's plenty of them. What do you have to say about that, Joe? Well, the, it all comes down to supply and demand here. And the big elephant in the room is uh, who is buying government debt and treasuries. That's the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest elephant in that room. Um, and that is why over the past like two weeks, Jack and I have talked about this a few times. We've seen multiple people, whether it's uh, like, I think there was a Goldman Sachs analyst or a couple other people in Janet Yellen, most recently coming out and talking about, Hey, we need to solve the liquidity problem in the treasury market. What they're really dancing around, and if you read between the lines, what's going on is they're saying there's no more buyers of treasuries. Um, the Bank of Japan, uh, the uh, 10 year treasury and uh, 10 year government bond in Japan went no bid for like four days straight. Um, nobody's buying government debt right now around the world. And so that what that means is nobody's lending to governments, at least at these rates. And so you have to solve that somehow. You can either raise rates to be an attractive place where people are willing to lend new money, but then that tanks the value of all the existing debt. So you you destroy any, any current bondholders. The other option is you cause there to be a buyer by having an entity that prints money to buy. But with inflation where it's at right now, the Fed will lose all credibility and be shut down politically by whoever wants to be next in power um, if they decide to start up QE again in order to buy bonds because let's say treasuries go no bid and they're the only buyer 
that's going to cause havoc and everything's going to freeze up. You need to have banks falling over within 24 hours. And so that's why you have people like Yellen starting to talk about, we need a new entity that will make sure there's liquidity in the credit, in the, uh, bond markets, what they're really saying is we need a new agency that has the power to print money to buy these things because nobody else is buying them. And if we have the Fed do it, then uh, it'll, uh, you know, everybody will lose faith in the Fed. So we need a new entity to come in here and be able to buy these things because nobody else is buying them. Uh, but you've got to get money from somewhere. You've got to get purchasing power from somewhere. And if it's not actual purchasing power, it's printed into thin air. So it's just like another central bank, which means you're just printing money. It's MMT. It's inflationary. And so um, I, 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 it is only a matter of time before the current path knocks something over that is so big that they figure out a creative way to pivot without making it look like they pivoted. Okay. Yeah, I, so can I throw one point in real yeah, quick? Yeah, go ahead, Jack. And it, it's, it's ironic because it's, it's so crazy that nobody's even going to propose it. The a third option, you know, rather than, creating some new entity to buy up all the government debt. There's this crazy third option that's available out there. That is, we just stop issuing so much of the government debt. I know it sounds crazy. <laughs> I just throw them out there, but we could as a country, as individuals, as a civilization, we could stop robbing the future, which is what you do when you create debt, you rob the future. And we can live within our means. Maybe we don't need 18 aircraft carriers when the next biggest country in the world only has two. I, I just throw them out there. Right. I mean, maybe we don't need to spend all this money on war. Maybe we don't need to pay millions of people to do nothing. I, I mean, it's 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 nobody is talking about it, it wouldn't be such a problem. We wouldn't have this liquidity problem in the bond market if there weren't so many freaking bonds. Right. You could also instead of creating new demand for bonds by creating this government blob that's going to buy them all up, just limit the supply. Don't borrow so much. I know it's a crazy idea, but it's got to be said, nobody is even proposing this anywhere in the world right now. So. Here's the problem. I've still got people that are watching us right now that don't know what to do with their $400,000 in the bank. And I'm going to keep making these videos and trying to bring you guys value in every one of them because I want to cover a couple more questions. And this, this video is getting kind of long. So, and, and if you guys are willing, we'll do it again. But, uh, I really want to try to help these people and I'm learning as well. I'm learning right along with everybody. So uh, a few things that come to mind, will we see COVID level stock stocks again? Will we see Amazon? At, you know, I, I don't remember what it was. Will we see uh, Bitcoin at 300 bucks? I don't remember exactly what they were, but it was crazy low. That's when I want to get in the stock market. That's when I'm ready to play again. I don't want to buy stocks that don't look good on paper that are just going to go up because that's what they do. I mean, I, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to play it safe. I want to hold my cards close to me and, and watch the other side of the table real close. I'm a big precious metals holder. You know, uh, I always say 10 to 50%. Uh, most of the millionaires are doing that. They're holding a big chunk of cash and they're waiting for these buying opportunities. So, how can we, I know we got way off on the bond and, and all, every, but that's what it takes to answer these questions. I get it. I get it. That's what it takes. But how can we streamline it a little bit better right here mm -hmm. at the end of the video? All right. I'm going to give some real tangible, quick uh, action steps. Number one, you have to have cash no matter what, because we might have severe deflation like the Great Depression. You must have cash. In that case, you need to have physical cash because cash in the bank, you may not be able to get it out if push comes to shove. So you have to have physical cash at the end of the day. Uh, you have to have physical gold because if you have deflation or inflation, gold is going to preserve its purchasing power. It's not going to make you rich, but the amount that you can buy with it will always be just about the same. And sometimes it goes up a lot. Um, you also need to have some exposure to the stock market because asset prices over time do go up because companies have an incentive to make more money. If you look at the last hundred years of valuations of, of publicly traded companies, in 2009, they were not cheap. In 2018, when the market crashed, they were not cheap. In 2020, when the market crashed, they were not cheap. And today, they are not cheap. But that doesn't mean that you should not have bought. 
All that means is that if you're looking at the last hundred years, then you would have stayed out of the game. So you need to be in the game because valuations may never go, come back down to their hundred year uh, cheap uh, metric. So you have to understand how to value stocks. And so one easy thing to do is look up how to calculate the intrinsic value of something. You basically look up how much money it makes, what the chances are it continues to grow at its pace that it's grown at for the last five years, and then calculate how much you are looking to make. Based off of that, how much are you willing to pay for that company today? If that company is going to be worth $100 next year, would you be willing to pay $100 for it this year? No, it's expensive. So you have to know subjectively for yourself. Finally, if you don't want to actually plunge the money in to buy the stocks, you need to know how to use options. So number one, you need to know how to use puts because if everything crashes, you get rich from the crash by buying puts. You also need to know how to buy calls because then you can make a bet that the stock will go up. And if it goes up a lot, you win. If it doesn't go up a lot, you only lose a little bit instead of losing a lot on buying the whole share. And so you need to do a little bit of research and learn basic options trading, buying puts and buying calls to speculate on big moves up or down so that you're at least in the game somewhat so that you're not sitting all in cash. And then you wake up five years, 10 years later and realized that was the worst it was ever going to get. Is the, Do you cover that in your course? Yeah, my uh, asset allocation course, I covered my recommended allocations to each of the asset classes. And then I have a whole section on speculating and hedging with options. And then in my bear market investing course, I go over fundamental analysis and uh, calculating intrinsic value. Nice. Okay. It'll be in the description. Jack? I feel like James Carville in old school right now after Will Farrell answered the debate question. Like, no, that, that was that was perfect. I have nothing, nothing that. Uh, all right, I'm going to get real simple then since Joe's answer was really good. Um, I guarantee you somebody is watching right now who is sitting on a whole bunch of cash, wondering what to do with it, and they are conveniently experiencing some selective memory loss because they're also carrying five figures credit card debt. All right. And if you're that person, it's all right. I know a lot of really smart people, good earners who are in that position. And I get this question all the time. Pay off the dang credit card. That is adjustable rate debt. And every time we you hear us talking about the Fed hiking and interest rates going up, that is the interest expense on that adjustable rate debt getting more expensive. You are a financial slave, even if you have money in the bank. If you're carrying that big balance on a credit card, get rid of it. You don't really have any money. All right. You have a big negative and a big positive and they cancel each other out. The difference is the negative is getting bigger and the positive is getting smaller. So before you do anything, zero out that credit card every time. That was yes. a great. Hey, Jack, yeah. Joe's got some big shoes to fill. And you, that's a very, very, very good point. Get out of credit card debt. That is so many people get sucked into that and it's it's uh, you cannot dig your way out you just have to sell a kidney and get out of it you just got to do whatever you got to do don't take my advice don't sell a kidney I'm just saying. it's so important it's i i have to say also you it's more important than car it's more auto loan debt it's more important than mortgage it's more important than any debt it's it's the highest it'll always be above inflation it'll it'll so i there will be millions of people who will not be able to make their minimum payments soon because their minimum payments will go up so much from the interest rates going up it is that important and it's not it's not an intelligence thing all right i i know a lot of very smart people some of them even phd's who fall for this trap it's not an intelligence thing it's a psychological thing all right. And I, I don't ex personally have it. I don't experience it. So I don't know what goes into it. But I know it's not stupidity that makes people do that. All right. So don't feel stupid. It's a it's a very common thing. But get out of it. Stop. Stop doing it. And if you're sitting on cash and credit card debt at the same time. Get rid of that credit card debt. Do it before it's too late. It's getting more expensive. I have people reach out to me, said they, you know, their mom died and they had to sell a house and now they have all this cash. Uh, they want to buy silver. Okay, cool. Do you have any debt? Yes, I've got credit card debt. Don't buy silver. Buy, get rid of the debt. Period. One yep. hundred percent, all the way around. Done. Get out of it. Whatever it takes. If you don't take anything away from this conversation, take that away. And this is not. We're not looking down on you at all. This happens. I understand. Take care of it now. It will fester and get worse. So 
I hope I push that home. Now, I've got one more question and I've got to go because I have, this is rocked on too long. I, I wanted this to be faster, but this is such an important topic that just seemed to go a little bit longer. Uh, nobody answered my question. <laughs> Are we going to see COVID levels again where I'm going to get to buy stock at the bottom? That's what I want to know. Look in your crystal ball and check that out for me. And last, answer that one real quick. Just, you know, don't spend a lot of time on it. And the very, very last question we're going to go is if you had to say one thing, and in the next episode, we'll do another thing, but one thing to somebody that's just waking up to what's happening. So there's a lot of people that are just waking up to buying precious metals they, they didn't know you know there's uh and if you're prepping or you're just learning that food's uh, going to be an issue and you're, you're doing that you know you're one of these people uh what is one thing you'd tell that person to do right now and uh are we going to see covid level stock market again go ahead joe uh i think no it's possible so i have puts just in case but i i am i i think it is far more likely we do not see cheap stocks to, to the point where people say, oh yeah, that's a good deal. Um, somebody's just starting off, I would say, um, figure out right now, go put some money, as long as you don't have credit card debt, go put some money in Bitcoin and some money in gold. I don't care how much it is. Buy one American Eagle. Uh, buy, uh, you know, put $1,000 in Bitcoin. Figure out how to do it so that you know how to do it because it's very possible you'll need uh, wealth outside the financial system. And if you don't have it by the time you need it, you won't be able to get it. And so buy some gold, no matter how much, and buy some Bitcoin, no matter how much, so you know how to do it and you can do it and you can get it more if you need more. That's good. Jack? All right. First of all, I hope and I pray that we see COVID level lows again. I, I pray we do. For the, Me too. For the hope, for, for the sake of our kids, I hope we see it again, because if we don't go that low again, it's only because we have robbed our future even more. The debt pile is so big right now, it cannot ever, ever be repaid. There is no hope of getting out of $90 trillion in combined debt in the United States, if you add up federal, state, local, personal. It can't ever possibly be repaid. So if we don't go that low in the stock market again, it's only because we've chosen to turn on the money printers and not change our behaviors and keep borrowing more endlessly. And it just means we have committed to more misery and more suffering for future generations. So I pray that we see those COVID lows again. I think we will. I think we will, I hope we will, not because I enjoy pe seeing people miserable, but to quote Joe, there, you can't eliminate risk, you can only spread it, you can only move it around. And if we take that risk away from ourselves, we're putting it on the future and they don't deserve it. They haven't even been born yet. Uh, now, the second part of the question, if there's one thing I could tell somebody, um, I know a couple of guys, a couple of really smart guys, nice guys, and they hate wealth. They hate money. They hate finance. They, they recoil in disgust at the mention of financial topics, um, which it makes it hard to be around me because I never shut up about it. Um, but don't fall for that. Don't, this stuff is not that hard. All right. It's actually once you learn a couple of really basic relationships between rates and the price of this moves that it's actually really simple. It's not more than like seventh or eighth grade math, the basics of this stuff. Um, but they want you, they being the financial services industry, the people who have put us in this mess, they want you to think it's too hard for you to understand. And you're better off just letting them handle the decisions for you. They relieve you of that burden. Isn't that so nice of them? And they use big words like transitory to try to convince you they're so much smarter than you. It's just, you know, it's not even, it's just another way to say temporary. It doesn't make them more, more smart. It just makes them more verbose. Um, start learning it. It's never too late to start learning it, no matter what your age, where you are at life. I didn't really start studying and looking into this stuff until I was in my late thirties when I was a knucklehead for most of my life. And I totally ignored finance and I did what everybody did. I did my nine to five or more like a nine to nine. A lot of times, um, I put my money into my 401k. I bought a few stocks here and there, but I never really bothered to educate myself. And in this day and age, ignorance is a choice because the information is out there. There's your channel. There's Joe's channel. There's Ninja. There's Dan. There's all these other guys out there. You can learn so much if you just decide to do it. So don't buy that line that this isn't for you, that that's, you need these Ivy League finance guys to handle it. It's not true. 
Okay, for everybody that's watched till the end, make sure you go subscribe to Jack at Nobody Special Finance. Check out Joe Brown with Heresy Financial. These guys are super smart. They're on top of their game. I know them personally. I can vouch for them. I will leave Joe's uh, course, both of them, in the description below. And if you do want to buy precious metals, my wife is a broker for Miles Franklin. I suggest shopping around first because I don't care where you get it as long as you get it. You need it to hedge your wealth. That's what the wealthy do. The trick is to do what the wealthy do. You know, that's how you get wealthy. <laughs> it's a cheat. So, guys, thank you so much for being here. I will see you in the next one. Have an awesome, awesome day. Later. <laughs>